Hi, everyone. I've got Fluffy with me tonight because chocolate is now sort of following his brother and turning the lights uh, into a game as soon as we flip them on. But uh, tonight, Fluffy came. And guess what? We broke 149,000 subscribers this week. We're now so close to 150,000 that we're now planning to have our champagne celebration with all of you around the world on the first broadcast in September. That's September 2nd. Chocolate and Fluffy will be here and my dear brother is going to come to open the champagne and help us toast all of you everywhere. So imagine in your mind's eye seeing champagne being poured here and where you all live. And then imagine seeing those champagne glasses filled with these fine amber bubbles. And then imagine all of us together among the digital electrons, raising our glasses together for a huge celebration cheer, for having each other to share our questions about the mysteries of the earth and our strange universe, and to open up those experiences of high strangeness that we all have encountered and some people have lived with for a lifetime without telling anybody ever. Until now, here at the Earth Files YouTube channel, it means everything to me. And the reason that we picked that date of September 2nd is that Brad has to go on a trip tomorrow and he will not be back to Albuquerque until August 16th. And then in safety because of COVID, he has to quarantine for 14 days before we can start working together again. So that takes us to the end of August. And by then, based on the steady climb in your subscriptions, we have had for several months now, we should break through the 150,000 subscriber goal by the time Brad is ready for work again back here. So that is why the September 2nd date for our champagne celebration, circle it on your calendar. And between tomorrow and September 2nd, I'm going to seriously try to get deeper into the memoir of my life that is a huge challenge. And Peggy has selected three of our most popular Earth Files YouTube broadcasts before 2020 to rebroadcast on August 12th, 17th, and the 24th. And we would love for all of your feedback on those shows because now we have an audience around the world and a lot of you may not have seen them and they were favorites. And remember back in the first week of July, I reported about the June 23rd mysterious loud jet sound circling over an Austrian mountaintop, but nothing visible in the blue sky and puffy white clouds. You can find this original report at my Earth Files News website, www.earthfiles.com. That's when architecture software designer Richard from Vienna, Austria, videotaped the hugely loud jet sounds that seemed to circle and circle for some 17 minutes, stopping, starting, and to date, there has never been any explanation. Well, on July 29th last week, I received this email from Constanza Jaramillo from Manizales, Colombia. That is a city of about half a million northwest of Bogota. And she wrote, quote, I didn't hear it myself as I live in Bogota, but a lot of my members of my family heard it, and it was in different towns, some towns, say, 50 kilometers away from each other, or even 100 kilometers, heard these sounds. The sound is like a very low jet and very loud. I do have an audio from my cousin and also a video. They search in the app for airplanes, but no airplanes were in the zone 
when we heard these sounds. Plus, the air traffic these days in Colombia is very low because of COVID, close quote. Constanza also sent me a local news report about not only the loud jets without any aircraft visible in the sky, but people in Manizales have also been reporting the sound of trumpets waking them up in the middle of the night. Constanza wrote to me that, quote, one of my aunts said it was a metallic sound as if someone in the middle of the night was moving something very heavy and she thought the world was ending, close quote. Constanza says that her parents and cousins have also heard the loud jet sounds overhead without seeing planes. So now let's take a look at another cell phone video since the Austrian one. And this is one of Constanza's family members who recorded in the last week of July, very recently, after sunset and the moon was up. And it is not only Colombia and Austria. On July 31st, The Guardian in the UK headlined, Weather Watch, Apocalyptic Sky Sounds Baffle Experts. From celestial trumpets to Darth Vader breathing, mysterious noises from above have been heard around the world during COVID lockdown. The geography of puzzling sky noises is worldwide. In addition to Austria and Colombia, strange unexplained sounds this summer have also been reported in the United States, Mexico, Slovakia, Italy, Brazil, and Argentina. Explanations range from people being able to hear more in the new city silences of COVID to even the possibilities of one or more alien intelligences interacting with Earth. Alien intelligence has also been linked by law enforcement to the phenomenon of bloodless, trackless animal mutilations. This week, I have a new in-depth Earth Files report about eerie animal mutilations in Oregon and England. Animal mutilation reports that I always place in the real X-Files category behind a subscription wall so that children and other sensitives are protected from the photographs. But the photographs that I have by the hundreds really are not gory at all. It's their pristineness that has always stunned everyone. After 41 years of investigating and working with veterinarian pathologists and other medical experts, it is always the precision of the excisions without blood and the lack of struggle or any tracks at the sites where mutilated animals are found that separates this mystery from the common but misinformed explanations of predator disease and satanic cult. 
what I have studied for so long is not explained by any of those categories. And what happened in Oregon on July 23rd in Fossil, Oregon, 172 miles southeast of Portland, is also unique in my four decades of traveling around the world to investigate animal mutilations. This image that I have in my August 4th, 2020 Earth Files headline shows what the cow's owner, David Hunt, first saw when he was looking for the cow. This black Angus in this photo is sitting on its bent knees and the left eye seems intact and even functioning. And yet, upon close examination, her tongue was excised and her udder and vaginal tissue removed with no bleeding anywhere. Wheeler County Sheriff's Deputy Jeremiah Holmes investigated and told the local Capitol Press, quote, there was definitely foul play involved in this animal's death. She died in a position she could not have gotten into by herself. I don't have any kind of logical explanation for it. But all of you know that in my interviews with sheriffs and deputies, starting in Colorado in 1979, 41 years ago, that the surrounding states and then on to the whole planet, I have been told over and over again by people in law enforcement, including the retired Sheriff Tex Graves up in Northern Colorado, that, quote, the perpetrators of mutilated animals are creatures from outer space, close quote. In terms of who the alien perpetrators could be, today, earlier, I was thinking before this broadcast about the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was back in my second book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses, that I wrote a prologue that included a quote from the Testament of Amran, translated by Professor Robert Eisenman. It says, quote, I saw watchers in my vision the dream vision. Two men were fighting over me, holding a great contest over me. I asked them, who are you that you are thus empowered over me? And they answered, we have been empowered and rule over all of mankind. And they said to me, which of us do you choose to rule you? I raised my eyes and looked, and one of them was terrifying in his appearance, like a serpent, his cloak, many colored, yet very dark. And then I looked again, and in his appearance, his visage was like a viper. I replied to him, this watcher, who is he? And he answered, this watcher, his three names are Belial and Prince of Darkness and King of Evil. And I said to the other watcher, my Lord, what dominion have you? And he answered, you saw the viper and he is empowered over all darkness while I am empowered over all light. My three names are Michael, Prince of Light, and King of Righteousness. Throughout Earth's history, including the Garden of Eden, the reptile has been described as a teacher, a leader, a king, or perhaps the Prince of Darkness. What I now want to share with you, the firsthand testimony of a woman who was married to a United States Air Force Staff Sergeant, who was the flight chief at Edwards Air Force Base in Kern County, northeast of Lancaster, California. Her name is Celestine Starr. And in 1971, she married Ernest Robert Hunt, who worked 
in the U.S. Air Force Special Forces and became flight chief of Edwards Air Force Base Security in the 1970s decade of their marriage. They had one child, a daughter, and they lived in a house where they could never talk about his work. He warned her that at their home, it was always tapped because of the sensitive nature of his Edwards Air Force Base work. She had gotten used to his silence until one night he came home from work angry. And when she pushed him about what was wrong, his answer led to the most shocking revelation in Celestine's life. Sometimes whatever would happen would be so devastating or traumatic for him that he would have to drink. And so when he came home and he had to drink, I knew that something had been very difficult for him. He let me know without a shadow of a doubt that he couldn't talk because our home was tapped, as he said. So that meant to me that everything was being recorded. So in order to talk in your house, did he have a signal for you, and what happened? He would have us step outside, or he would play music loud. He wasn't sure on what level what was happening in the house. So it was better to take a drive and play music loud or step out of the car for a moment after he drove quite a way. And was it in that move to Edwards Air Force Base after five years of marriage that you heard from him for the very first time that he had knowledge of extraterrestrial entities on this planet? Yes, it was the very first time. Do you remember that first discussion, how he signaled what he did and what you learned? He came in the door, and I can see on his face that something had happened. I'd seen it before, but he wouldn't talk about it. So I just said, I need to know. And he leaned over to me and whispered, the reptilians, those reptilians. And I didn't quite understand if he was talking about a lizard who lived in the desert, but it took me a while him to just keep looking at me, and I would kind of make my mouth to where I'd say, not from here, and he'd tilt his head, and then he just went into the drinking. He didn't leave. He didn't want to go out of the house. So from that point on, he was not happy in his heart. It became very difficult for him and for myself to deal with the energies that he would bring home. Very, very heavy energy. And I knew he was struggling with it, and he was angry about it. He would come home again, those reptilians. But he would say it so low, and I had figured out that it was literally (laughs) some kind of intelligent reptilians that he was working with. How did this evolve to a point where he finally wanted to show you? I would say within a month, the space shuttle came and landed and took off. I think they stored it there for a time. So he said, get in the truck. We're going for a ride. And so I said, okay. It was the very first time he had really had me get in and go with him anywhere. If somebody said, can you describe Edwards Air Force Base, I go, Yes, I know where I live and some parts of the base, but it's mostly 99% restrictive. You're not going to just wander around Edwards without people knowing you're there. So because he was the flight chief over all of the security over this base, I went with him, and the first place he took me was out in the desert near the space shuttle that had come in, and it was just parked out on one of the landing strips. He said, Take some photographs. Isn't that amazing? Take photographs. And later I understand I had to take the photographs because he couldn't. It was against the regulations for him to do that. I took the photographs, and then he 
drove me towards the tarmac and so towards the hangars. So we went towards these groupings of hangars, huge hangars that would hold airplanes, test models. It was a place for testing different rockets and jets. So they have huge hangars. And he parked near one, and he said, okay, just kind of nodded to me to get out. I wasn't sure what to do, but I just followed him. I was his wife, and he just walked in, and nothing was said or paid attention. I just went straight in. And as we got into the hangar, he went to the right, and there was just a wall with a kind of like a square box. And it looked like an elevator might be there. It had a steel door across it. And he put in a code, and it opened, and sure enough, it's an elevator. And we went inside. I was kind of amazed. We went down, down, down. It was quite a ways. We ended up on this particular floor. I'm sure we went past many floors. But as we got off the elevator, there was vast caverns. You could go to the right, the left. So we walked down one particular cavern, and as we got down a ways, he stopped. We got in this one area. You could say like little offices, but everything is cement. He just leaned against the wall to the left, and he kind of nodded to me to look in the window. And the window was small, rectangular, with very thick glass. And I reached up, so I looked in, and it almost stopped my heart. In there was a reptilian being, fierce-looking, probably about seven feet. And just as I was gazing in, it turned its head, and it had the reptilian face with an elongated nose, but it had an apparatus over its mouth. It looked like a lizard person standing up, but the hind legs were much bigger, stronger, arms in muscular chest, green, green skin, scaly, different colors of green to yellowish, you know, yellow-green around the inside of the arms, hands with sharp, claw-like hands. And those hands that were claw-like, if you were comparing to an earth life, what would it be closest to? Mm -hmm. If you just picked your hand up and you kind of curved it, Five fingers. Five fingers, for sure, yes. Each finger was about an inch wide, and then the claw would just kind of dip over the the nail, which gave it a claw-like look. What greens were you looking at, and could you describe in detail the eyes that you could see? The color would be like a uh, dark olive green. If you took grass and you darkened it, look at a frog. You know, the green frogs are usually kind of a darkened green. Mm -hmm. All across the face, down, dark. Maybe just the lightning is inside of the neck. I felt it was a male. Didn't feel female at all. Or androgynous, but it was very menacing. The inside of the hands were very light in color. Pale yellow. The tail, all the way back to the tail, was very dark. The eyes yellow, really deep, like cat eye yellow, deep yellow. If you took cat eyes and you turned it sideways and elongated it, it would be something like that. The cat has a vertical pupil in that yellow. Huge almond eyes, but the uh, slit would be vertical. They had a slit in their eye. Did you stay at the window as long as you wanted, or what happened? Oh, no. No. The moment it looked around, it pierced my heart. It was like it scanned me. And I jumped back from the window, and I almost fell on the floor. I was trembling. Where was your husband standing at that moment? Oh, he was standing to the left of the whole window, and he was satisfied that I understood what was going on. He needed me to know. He wanted the world to know. Now, can you take us to the discussion you had with your husband about that reptile? We came home, and that night was not, we did not speak. There's nothing to say. I just had to hold it in. It wasn't too long after that 
the ice men, I call them the ice men, came to our home, and we're talking about a day or so. What that looks like is a knock at the door. I answer. Ernest is there. A man with steel blue eyes, heavy set with other men behind him, is at the front door and says, we need to speak to Hunt. And I just opened the door because what are you going to do? <laughs> and they came in and Ernest came out and said, you need to just go and sit in the bedroom quiet, just sit in the bedroom quiet. And uh, after they had the discussion, I realized that our lives were in danger, my daughter, myself, and Ernest. Whatever had transpired wasn't good. I don't know if it was because he took me down there or whatever it was, but it wasn't good. So when I came out, I said, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to get us out. And I said, well, with what we know, I don't think they're going to let you out. And he said, I will get us out. That year of 1977, Ernest Roberts Hunt was able to negotiate an honorable discharge after his service to the United States Air Force. Then he and Celestine and their daughter headed to Northern California. Sadly, two years later, the couple divorced in 1979. Decades later, after Ernest died at age 66 on September 21, 2014, Celestine honored his life journey to galactic consciousness. Is there any specific reason that your husband gave you after his honorable discharge about why we were working with reptilian entities that were intelligent and clearly another life species cohabiting with us on the planet? He talked about basically it is about the control of the Earth. And this species has the ability to take over the Earth. But they're working in alliance with Strategic Command in exchange for certain things that I was not privy to, but I know that he told me that there was two levels in exchange for technology. I'm giving this information because it's historic. And my husband put his life on the line for humanity. There's a whole life of humans traveling from Earth, and you, Linda, have been very instrumental in bringing the information forward through officials and whistleblowers, you know? Right. But I'm saying from a wife that has witnessed, I know without a doubt, there is other species that our government is working with, period. Case closed. That's it. Celestine was so impacted by that decade with Ernest, that she began to evolve in ways that she never ever could have predicted at that time of her life when they first married. The experience of seeing something that was reptilian in an enclosure that seemed to be a power center of some sort sent her off on a path that today has blossomed into a book that she has written. It came out in the last year or so. It is called The Galactic Earth Council, Reintegration of Earth Kin and Star Kin. And her hypothesis is that we are they, they are us, and that the universe is so much more complex than we've ever been taught and that everything that we've talked about here at the Earth Files YouTube channel about the genetic manipulation of DNA and already evolving primates, all of that would be the landscape on which she has evolved to try to understand and explain in a way to her very inner core what happened in those years of the 1970s. Those two people loved each other, and they really did love each other to the day that he passed. But there was so much anger, so much repressed, no ability to live a normal life. 
And that goes to the heart of the question that I have raised here so many times. When we are in a government that has so many policies of lies, of lies and denials, that it warps. It warps not only individual souls, it warps the soul of a nation. And it seems to me, as it does to Celestine and so many others in the group that are coming here on Wednesday nights, that if we could somehow get this planet back on some kind of an honest square with itself so that all of us knew the truth, the truth about reptilians and Nordics and grays and oranges and blues and praying mantises, the list goes on and on and on. And the, the scientists uh, who have inside information and more of the military whistleblowers like Spartan 1 and 2 and on, and the remote viewers like Lynn Buchanan, the universe is teeming with consciousness in life. Why shouldn't Homo sapien sapien on this planet be told the whole truth? Whatever it is, so we could grow up and maybe have mature interactions with what was described as a teacher in the Garden of Eden. So the complexity of even what the reptiles could be is hidden. That Amran scroll is worth looking up again and studying and reading about it yourself. And just for uh, everybody to know that uh, Celestine, the book, The Galactic Earth Council, Reintegration of Earthkin and Starkin, it's available at Amazon and half a dozen other book distributors. A beautiful book. She is a kind, kind, wise soul. And uh, becoming familiar with the work and effort of Celestine, I think a lot of you would like. And I would also like to make a personal appeal as the investigative reporter and producer that I am, that um, I dove deep tonight into a story about a reptilian that would be either consulting with, guiding, interacting with very, very secretive special operations in an Air Force base. And maybe it's not unique. Maybe someone watching tonight or several of you has firsthand eyewitness documents, photographs, maybe an entity or entities. And I would just like to encourage all of you who do have firsthand information and documents that you can provide some sort of uh, firm backing for, that you can get a hold of me at Proton Mail. Uh, some people use FedEx. Some people use the hard US mail. And uh, I am very interested in hearing firsthand testimonies of people who have had interactions with beings that might actually be working with and collaborating with our government, other governments. It's as if we are on two worlds, one without ETs, the other with collaborating out in space and underground. How do we bring those two together into one planet, one human species that maybe would stop warring if we all knew the truth? That's a prayer of mine every day. And now, Peggy, what kind of questions and comments do we have tonight? Hi, Linda. First, I'd like to thank everybody for the super chats. So thank you, Rachel R., Moonbird, Mike Martin, Dolores Graff, Phoenix Starbin, Jay Brown Face, The Rabid Monk, 
Cindy Smith, Cat Chaser, RJ Ring, Cheryl Morrow, Crystal Jade, Carl, Vicky Martinez, and Sonia. Thank you so much for your chats tonight. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, everything in this world today helps, and I'm very grateful to all of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And chocolate has walked in. Brad, hand, hand me chocolate so I can, int oh, he's going, he'll probably come back and jump up on this table and then I'll show you. Uh, I just am so amused at the way chocolate and fluffy sort of taunt and they know uh, that when these lights come on uh, that they can saunter in and out and uh, that I won't be uh, going after them. And it's kind of funny. Um, go ahead, Peggy. I have a great question here by a viewer who just chatted. Does Linda know of any alien species that would want to hu hurt humanity? Well, the implication about the reptilians going all the way back to the time of the Dead Sea Scroll, the very fact that there would be that ancient and profound scroll with the viper identified as the prince of darkness raises the question, why? Because in the scroll, it is announced as if the viper wearing the many colored cloak that is dark is proud of being the prince of darkness. And the prince of light, Michael, is proud of being the prince of light. And we're back to that ongoing metaphor of the yin and the yang, the black and the white, the white and the black. The part that to me seems so important and is frustrating is that because we're on a planet that has been lied to by all of the genetic manipulators from the beginning, then Homo sapiens sapien, us, we are like bacteria on a petri dish under a microscope. How would we ever get an objective view of what we are, of what the relationship would be to intelligences out there that maybe remote viewers say there are friendlies, unfriendlies, and neutrals? What are the basis for their divisions? Why are the CIA, the NSA, and the DIA putting some in these categories of friendly, neutral, and unfriendly if we knew how they were deciding which is in which category? Would it be just for technology, the barter system? Is the barter system what is still running all of those decisions when maybe the whole planet ultimately would be so much better off if all of the decisions were being made about what life forms should live on Earth, how to keep them healthy, and the education of the soul. Uh, ultimately, as I've said before, I really do think that way beyond money in the barter system, that learning the value and learning the profound importance of the soul in relationship to recycling life, a kind of eternal relationship with this universe and other universes and dimensions and timelines, that the potential might be that if we really truly understood what the whole process was and how it works and why some intelligences advance technologically, may be trying to hijack the souls of Earth. And if we learn that, what will we do? How would we change our priorities? What would we do to protect our soul? Think about that. Think about that. So who are our true friends? I would put in that category the three avatars of history who appeared 
before zero day of the crucifixion of Christ. Those three avatars would be Krishna and Buddha and Christ. I think that the avatars that have come and gone on the earth, they know something that we humans don't understand. And they have some vested interest in inspiring us to evolve, to know love and light and peace. And right now in this age of COVID, it feels like this microbe that's one twenty thousandth of a millimeter and has turned the world upside down, inside out, bass backwards. This, this tiny, tiny lethal microbe sort of rubs in our faces. What are your priorities? What is the most important? And everywhere we are seeing human after human after human saying, I will stay home, I will keep my children home because more than money and more than a job, I want to live. So this is a time of a different kind of clarity. And we need all of it. We need all of the facets, clearly, to be healthy and productive on the earth. But maybe if we could finally move from the age of COVID to the age of honest relationship with other life and consciousness in this universe, we might truly begin to evolve on this beautiful, wonderful planet without self-destructing in our completely seeming unconscious abuse of this gorgeous, wonderful planet. Somehow we have to learn how to balance it all, and we certainly are not there yet. But at the top, and I've said it so many times, it's our humanness that I think is so special with our soul, and that whether it was the viper in front of the uh, man on the ground, or the blonde, or whoever it is, they have a deep interest in what happens to us. So I hope, as we keep going forward, that soon, sooner than later, like this year yet, that we will finally have more than tantalizing teases about UFOs caught on infrared that we will finally get a confirmation that is political and global. We're not alone. And maybe finally we will be introduced to what the question was about. Who is friendly? Who is neutral? Who is unfriendly? And what are the factors that are being used to make those categories? I would love to know. Okay, thank you. What about another question? Uh, another viewer wants to know, we've heard a lot about the alien agenda. What would you say is the human agenda towards them? It is an excellent question, and it is focused in my discussion with Celestine. And that one question when I ask... Um, did her husband uh, ever talk with her about why would this major, absolutely major experimental and testing range, Edwards Air Force Base in California, one of the most important in the United States, have a seven foot tall reptilian looking creature clearly with intelligence, inside of some kind of a cement room that had a window, and that Celestine 
instantly upon the turning of the head. So the, the reptile is this way, and then she said, like that, right at her. And that in that moment, from here to my hand is the head, looking at her, that she felt that she was being scanned, that she could sense it. I have no question. She had the impression through the little tiny, tiny bit of exchange with her husband that we were in collaboration of some sort. That this was an entity that was down in this deep, deep, underground, highly classified place because somehow we were in communication and it was involved with whatever they were strategizing in relationship perhaps to other non-humans and this whole question. If there are competing civilizations over Earth because it's a laboratory and it's a really valuable laboratory, uh, maybe the United States has a very specific vested interest in X, maybe China has one in Y, maybe Russia has one in Z, and that there is tremendous value in having some kind of a human contingency that has the ability to take the scans, take the downloads, take the telepathy, and translate. That's just a speculation. The idea that it was there in a hostile relationship is also brought up by what Celestine felt, that it was menacing. If something were collaborating with us on a military or a strategic energy reason or whatever, you wouldn't think that it would give off menacing energy. So it's a puzzle. That's why I would very much like to hear, even confidentially, from any of you out there who may have insights about what would be the true political, the true racial, meaning, or species, living species relationship between something that was clearly not homo sapien humanoid, would fall into the category of reptile doing many, many, we'll call them floors or the distance down in an elevator that came out in caverns where they had built those offices. Why was it there? And what is the true relationship? And that huge question, if the Amran scroll from the Dead Sea has the standing up viper, the face of the viper, that is the reptile, or this snake or an alligator or a lizard, as being a, sort of assigned in that Amran scroll with darkness and evil, what exactly does that mean? in relationship to light and love and peace, if the two, who do you want, who do you choose, human, to lead you? That's what the Amran scroll is. As if the viper and Michael are somehow collaborating together in front of the human and asking which one do you humans choose to lead you. I've always thought it was one of the most thought-provoking of all the Dead Sea Scrolls, that Amran right there. Clearly, we humans have a gut and intuition. And I think most healthy humans can tell when they're in the presence of something that is giving off negative frequency or, or positive frequency. And there we're into that landscape of all life, not just here, but throughout the universe, 
that there has always been the metaphor of the yin and the yang, the black versus white. I would profoundly like to understand what was the true source of that and what is the true uh, source, evolutionary profile of a universe like this one that recently I had a discussion with an extremely skilled um, man who knows a great deal about three-dimensional holograms. And he said in his mind, after all of the study he's done and discussions with people who are in the astrophysical world, who are trying to understand, is our universe, is our universe a hologram? And if it is, it is being projected by something in another dimension because you can't have the projector inside of the hologram. And this man that I talked to recently, who is really skilled, very knowledgeable, said from his point of view, he is now satisfied that we are in a hologram. That this universe that we look out at night and it's 13.8 billion light years to allegedly the beginning of this universe, the whole thing is somebody else's projection. And when you start thinking about those kinds of levels and you realize that we humans in order to truly evolve on this planet without killing ourselves and without killing this gorgeous laboratory earth, we need to understand these truths. Maybe somebody will say, well, you know, let's announce that the universe is a hologram. It was made by a vast intelligence in another dimension. And so in that announcement, we can just let everybody know, yeah, byline, yeah, we're not alone in the universe. They made this universe with a lot of other entities and intelligences. And maybe that's how they'll slide into finally confirming what we would all like to have confirmed. Peggy, what about one more question? A viewer had a great question. Why do you think the government would choose now for disclosure? What's the purpose behind this? I think what they're saying is why the tantalizing piece by piece headlines from Eric Davis and uh, Senator, retired Senator Reed of Nevada and uh, Lou Elizondo with To the Stars and uh, the various comments that have been leaking since December 16, 2017, um, about the fact that Navy pilots have uh, agreed that what they have gotten on their FLIR infrared is either moving at a speed or doing 90 degree angles or stopping uh, going uh, thousands of miles an hour, completely uh, throwing the idea of inertia out the window, um, that those are physical demonstrations that we humans cannot do and that we cannot make a vehicle that can do what has been monitored and recorded in the FLIR cameras. So that was a, like a good first pawn on the chessboard of let's play this game out for the next one year, two years, four years, five years. Somebody's got some sort of a timeline. And when we keep exposing the public drip by drip, drop by drop, then by the time it's finally announced, people will be sort of numb to uh, and feeling either way, yeah, we knew, we knew we're not alone. And they want a kind of ho-hum, just uh, talk about it enough, uh, drop in some of these more interesting sentences, like the one that I was reporting about from Eric Davis and uh, the um, Senator Reed from the July 24th New York Times, where they said, it was printed 
before, what, 24 or 48 hours later, somebody decided to change the words and call it a retraction. Um, and it was that, that the, these people, Eric Davis, uh, phys, an astrophysicist, and Senator Harry Reid, exposed to a lot of things related to UFOs and ETs, because that was a deep interest of his, that they were saying that they, one of the sentences was, could not be made here on Earth. So it's tiptoeing, tiptoeing around. And depending upon public reaction, and that's why the question about the time, we're in the worst, most lethal pandemic in 100 years. And I guess we should all be grateful every day for those of us who are alive to see another day and to mourn the 100, 50, 60, 70, how many thousands is it going to go of our fellow humans in the United States and way more around the world. That's dominating news everywhere. And nobody knows if we're going to have a quote unquote second wave like what is happening in Australia right now. It is a true second wave. They thought that they had it defeated in June. It's coming back like another monster. That's what a true second wave is. What will happen in the United States in a second wave? All of these questions are having to do with our survival and our children's survival. Even our pets, because they now know that cats and dogs can get COVID. So in a funny, strange way, COVID becomes like a screen. Everybody on, is on this side. 99% of the population is on this side of the COVID screen, wondering if they're going to have money, a job, survive, which relatives will be sick, which children, all of that. And so on this side, selectively, pieces of news are being put I read the New York Times every day. I think it's an absolutely astounding uh, reporting production. And when you read the New York Times on a daily basis, you began to see that you can track all sorts of things because they keep up such enormous coverage on so many facets of the world on a 24-hour, seven cycle. And as you see what comes up into play and what goes down and what comes up to play. It isn't just all politics. There's a lot of things that are now emerging from science that I would say, just based on a very thick folder that I have of science news, just this year alone, take COVID out of it. In astrophysics and astronomy, that the steady stream of reports about black holes and quasars and is this a holographic universe and it's like a whole brand new revisionary um, landscape of what this universe is and what kind of a much bigger cosmos of perhaps an infinite number of universes, it's all being discussed by very sophisticated astrophysicists and astronomers, as if that's also changing. And Elon Musk, it was a couple of days ago, maybe it was yesterday, time is going so fast, and he tweeted, the pyramids were built by aliens OBV, which I think is his word for obvious, I would agree with him 100%. And then what happened today? Uh, some archaeological person in Egypt uh, with puffed up said, 
uh, that Mr. Mr. Musk was completely wrong. Uh, humans made the pyramids. No, I think Mr. Musk is absolutely right that the pyramids underground and above ground and the obelisks and so much that we have had probably if we could l literally see in a time machine all of the different civilizations that have come and harvested and manipulated and terraformed this planet maybe for the last 270 million years. And we're only 2 million years old as a homo sapien species having to go from homo erectus up to where we are now. That we would probably just be stunned if we saw what really has happened on planet Earth. And this is just one of trillions of planets orbiting trillions of suns. I find it absolutely thrilling, exciting, in spite of all of the problems now, that we really are beginning to find out pieces of truth, even when political structures have been built for at least 70 years to keep us deliberately in the dark. The light is coming in from a lot of directions. And you guys, for me, every week, being able to come here, read your letters, read your uh, emails, read your proton mail, reading all of the things that you send, it just gives me so much hope that it doesn't all have to look in the future, like COVID and global warming will be what lasts. I really don't believe that. I really believe in human spirit and that the more true information we can have and what we can share with each other about our own relationships with this highly strange universe, would help all of us. So now, tonight, I am saying, not so long, I'm saying, get your champagne ready, get your best crystal glass, just because it's fun to drink in them, and that know over these next three weeks, I am going to try <laughs> to deal with my, what I call, going inside, deep inside, to try to start actually really truly hitting where I would like to in a memoir. And then, Brad, Brad, may you have the safest journey, get back with no COVID, everything be great. And then, on September 2nd, my brother, is going to open up the champagne. Brad will be here, and I will be here, and Fluffy and Chocolate will be in and out, and Peggy and Earth Files Support will be in Canada. And you guys, no matter where you are, forget the clock for that one night of September 2nd, and let's go live around the world in your mind, imagine that we are all connected. David Bohm, all mass is frozen light. This is mass. This is mass. It's all frozen light. So that night, with all of your questions for two hours, and Peggy is going to help do interface that keep in, let's do it. Let's do it with that as our, sort of our mantra that night. David Bohm, brilliant physicist. All mass is frozen light. I love you. 
stay safe.